everyone. I think we're ready to get started. Okay, there we go. So my name is Jenny Rose Delia Dufour, and I am the president of the Montgomery County chapter of the National Organization for Women. <laughs> um, for those of you who don't know, the county does have a chapter of now, and we are actually one of the largest chapters in the county. So if you would like more information on what we do, um, we actually have a table out in the lobby, but if you email info at mcmdnow.org, we can put you on our list and alert you to our actions or other things that we're doing in the area if you have an interest in getting involved. So I'm here today to introduce Judith Wells and the session Grit and Gusto, Grit and Gusto Farmerettes and Suffragettes on the Home Front in World War I. Judith Wells is a writer and former journalist who has authored local history books about the area in which she lives, such as Lily Stone and Cabin John, Legends and Life of an Uncommon Place. She also has written a work-life book for Kindle called Get a Life, Try This. <laughs> Judy, uh, excuse me, Judy was media relations manager for Price Waterhouse Coopers and IBM and also a speech writer for U.S. cabinet members. She has chaired the Montgomery County, Maryland Commission on Aging, been a board member of the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal Trust for the National Park, and is a sought after speaker for the Montgomery County Historical Society. <laughs> Please join me in welcome, welcoming Judy to the podium. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Great. Great. Thank you all so much for being here. This, in my view, was a time in our country's history uh, when women kind of took off. They already were starting the suffragette movement, you know that, in the late 1800s. We're now in 1914 or so when the World War I started. However, you have to keep in mind that World War I started in Europe and didn't really come to involve America until as late as, well, we actually started in 1917, but didn't really send people over till 1918. So what was going on on the home front and what was going on that caused change? Well, first of all, when men went to war, women took on new roles. So again, my thesis here is that women came into a new understanding and a new activity, largely because of the suffragette movement, but also because of World War I. Um, so it's interesting what happened here in Montgomery County. And please, if I, you don't hear me, I thought there'd be a mic in here. <laughs> please raise your hand and I'll keep trying to emote. Uh, America entered the war on April 6, 1917, and Montgomery County's draft quota was 131 men. But look what happened. 2,475 in Montgomery County signed up. This was a time of incredible patriotism. Uh, but also, young men left the farms. I mean, what was the main occupation back then? It was farmland. Laytonsville, Damascus, Gaithersburg, Rockville, Bethesda, to save Europe patriotism, but also, hey, see the world. Here was an opportunity to see the world. So women responded with patriotism too. Now look at the, I want you to think about what women were wearing. This is 1918. This is what she was wearing. Um, this is also giving you a few more data points if you're interested about how many Americans all over served and Maryland also exceeded its quota. But watch how dress changes. Okay, World War I, again, propelled the suffrage movement. National Women's Party uh, was the name of the suffragette movement here. And here's an example. There I am, right there. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have the right kind of hat, but well, you know, I'm close. <laughs> but on April 10th, remember, the war had just, we just declared war April 6th, and on April 10th, Maryland established the Women's Preparedness Commission. They also obviously were sending you know, recruitment and many other things to get ready for our part in the war, but they established a Women's Preparedness Commission. And 26 women were on it, mostly suffragettes. 
In June, that became the women's section of the Maryland Council of Defense. So already, Maryland was recognizing they had to do something about the women. <laughs> so here's, here's what a suffragette, in fact, this one over here, Harriet Stanton Blatch, the daughter of suffragette leader Elizabeth Cady Stanton, wrote a book, and in it she wrote, instead of just conserving, that is, you know, doing the usual, you know, uh, canning and various things, gardens, whatever, <laughs> women should be producing, becoming soldiers of the soil. So, well-known suffragettes became active in the Council of National, of National Defense and established the Women's Land Army. Now, the Women's Land Army really had started in Great Britain. And you have to understand why. Again, all of Europe, all men in all these countries are fighting. And again, who's producing the food? People are actually starving. And so in Europe, in England, they started a women's land army using, you know, the able-bodied women to come out, some not even so able-bodied, just get them out, uh, to um, run the farms in whatever land they could find in England. But in Europe, it was very hard to find the land because, you know, that was all trenches and whatever. Um, but anyway, so Harriet, who actually went to Vassar, I went to Vassar, it's just a coincidence, <laughs> but it, it <laughs> pleases me no end. I need a feather in my hat, but I need, I need this, I need that hat. But at any rate, uh, Vassar, uh, when I went there, had hundreds of acres, including farmland still, when I went there. And when she went there, it was all farmland, and they had a college for women, and that women were learning there how to farm the land. And so she took that idea and the fact that Great Britain had already started the, the Women's Land Army to establish the Women's Land Army here in America. Meanwhile, here's another suffragette showing what kinds of women were involved, a physician and Methodist. She, she, um, she headed the committee and she was on it, but she's the one who started the Women's Land Army in America. Anyway, so obviously they needed women to relieve the farm workers shortage. But it was not only critical to feed our own people, it was critical to feed our soldiers abroad and to ship food to the people starving in Europe. Uh, America began that kind of program of sending wheat and wheat grown here in Montgomery County um, to Europe. And here are the kinds of posters. So this one you saw in the beginning without all of the, all of the writing on it, the Women's Land Army of America, Again, the patriotism, she's carrying produce, and t saying where you can apply. This one is in the New York State office. And here, an example um, of a poster showing, get behind the girl he left behind. Isn't that cool? Join the, and note the costume. What happened to that long, beautiful dress? So, it, in addition to the shortage of farm workers, obviously, uh, we had to do continue to do the packing of uh, canned goods and so forth. And the uh, reason I, I talk about this is because Maryland women actually were heralded, were recognized for um, doing so much ca canning. They, they actually did a total of 848,460 <laughs> containers. I'm sorry, this data just interested me when I saw this report from the National Council of Defense praising Maryland women for doing all this canning and brining and drying of, of food. Again, for our own people, but also to send abroad. And so we did have war gar gardens. And the theme of the early days of the war was food will win the war. Well, who's producing the food? Women. Um, meat, and so we also had meatless and wheatless days. Did you, you all knew that, right? Where uh, Sunday, you would have one meal without any wheat, no bread and one meal without no meat, and, mon and you know, Monday, another one, all meals would, you know, there was a schedule. <laughs> Remember the days. <laughs> Again, this is uh, what the, the national, the federal government was trying to encourage was saving food so we'd have enough to feed our own people and send abroad. Um, so there's the U.S. Food Administration. I mean, that became a big deal, food. Here's an interesting aspect of this. You know the song, over there, over there. Well, the song Over Here 
was written during World War I to extol the virtues of meatless and wheatless days in the name of patriotic food conservation. The reason they wrote a song was you have to think about what our country was like in 1918. We still had, we had more than still, we had a large number of immigrants, large numbers of people speaking different languages, large numbers of people struggling to learn English some never quite getting it right. If you think about your great grandfather or your great or your grandmother, I mean, you know, not quite getting all the English right. So the way to communicate important messages from the federal government was through the radio and through music that minstrels would just sing on the streets. And it was part of the way they informed the public was through music. Uh, so this was a song. I don't actually know the words, but I. I saw the, um, the information about it. Uh, that was what to do over here about food and, meat, and meatless and wheatless days. Um, so World War I brought new responsibilities. Um, and here's an example. Mrs. Frank Stone, who I, some of you do know, was Lily Stone. Um, and this is actually what got me started on this particular project, research project. Uh, she was the founder of the Montgomery County Historical Society, but not yet. She didn't do that till 1944. But in 1918, uh, she was commissioned a lieutenant in the National Food Conservation Army. Woohoo! And see what she's wearing, how she looks. And she had, she and her husband, Frank Stone, had a 120 acre farm. And her son, uh, joined the army at a time when her husband had a stroke um, while he was gone. So uh, he enlisted, and he, it, this is her son. He was a private in the Air Service Mechanics, and he was sent to France. And of course, being a very practical woman, Mrs. Stone sent him wool socks, for sure, and a French dictionary, which also shows you, and this is her handwriting, I love this, uh, because it is in French, and it shows she could speak French. She could also, she actually could speak four, language, four languages because her father, who had been a farmer, wanted his daughter educated and actually built the first school in the area that they lived in, which was called, at that time, Cabin John. I also wrote that book, that's outside. <laughs> um, the first school in that area because he had a daughter and wanted her educated. Interesting. Um, so she learned, she went to uh, the, the uh, local one room schoolhouse, but then when she was 13, he sent her to a boarding school, so where she learned language. But anyway, get back to World War II, World War I, sorry. There's Dunbar, her son, in uniform, obviously a man about town with young women, see how they're dressed. <laughs> the uniform will do it every time. See, see, <laughs> see how they're dressed? Is that a school uniform for the girls? You know, it's actually, I'm just wondering if they were part of, there was a Young Women's Conservation Corps too, and I'm just thinking that uh, might have been that, uh, but on the other hand, it's plaid skirts also looks like a school uniform. I don't really know, um, but anyway, these are neighborhood uh, nearby farm daughters. And he sent this home. <laughs> it's one of his postcards. <laughs> Get it? Shoulder, arms. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but he also sent other postcards. These are World War I postcards. Um, assuring his mother that he was well, that she did not need to send any more wool socks, he had enough. He did tell her that. But he was worried about how she would fare handling the farm. Um, because again, her, his father had had a stroke. He was totally disabled, could not help. She did have one hired worker uh, who helped her, um, who was, by the way, African American which is another aspect of this, which is, uh, he was older, so that some of the, um, a lot of the farm workers left behind who, did, who weren't in the army were older men, or some of them um, African Americans. 
So she wanted him to get a furlough, but it just didn't work out. I mean, and in fact, during that war, farm workers or people who were critical to operations were, for, were allowed to get a furlough, but for some reason, and actually, I personally think Dunbar didn't try very hard. He was in Paris. <laughs> you know, when, once they get to Paris, right? <laughs> Um, but it, and this just shows, again, what it was like to be in World War I from one person's perspective. He, uh, he was an air service mechanic, so he you know, was the mechanic on these planes. And, he, and you can imagine, this was a farm boy, and he was now in Europe, and he was seeing this amazing thing. Can you imagine? I mean, the first time you saw an, air, an airplane, um, and he's saying when they're maneuvering for possessions and trying all sorts of tricks, sort of made one stand in amazement. You ought to see them when they do the leaf fall, you know, the spiral dive, the loop, the loop. There are uh, videos of this that you can find uh, today, you know, of, of these uh, planes doing just these things. It sure is wonderful the work the U.S. is doing over here. That's interesting. The song was over here, but it meant here. <laughs> Actually, that's his writing. And so I can't correct it, um, but you're right. You're not the only one who said that. And I've thought it too, but I, you know, you're right. However, that is his writing. Anyway, those in the Women's Land Army were known as farmer rats, and you knew that when you came to this, but it was Farmerette's suffragette. It was an adaptation by the suffragettes. They developed that name with both, as you might understand, positive and negative connotations. And here's one of the negative ones. The U.S. Department of Agriculture refused to endorse the Women's Land Army, refused to call up women to help at the farms, and instead called up young boys, as young as 13, and older city men, like lawyers, they would put out calls, we need more people helping on the farms, and they would absolutely not call up women. So um, at the same time, some Maryland farmers refused to allow women to work on their farms, partially because you have to think about this. Um, the farmers might have been the wives they left behind, or it might be an older gentleman and his wife, and she's thinking about, these young women coming into the farm, mm, I don't know how comfortable that is without a chaperone, you know, that kind of thinking in the day. But also, uh, there was a shortage of suitable housing. And the other thing was, again, as I mentioned, if you had any farm workers at that time, it would have been older African American gentlemen. And again, do you bring young girls from the college onto the farms when you've got? older African-American, you know, the whole racial and um, discrimination against women, discrimination uh, on color. In fact, that's the other thing you should know, is there were no uh, African-American women in the Women's Land Army. Because again, they felt that the people running it, um, and, and African-American women tried to, do, tried to be in it, uh, that it wouldn't work, that the white farmers, wouldn't want to have all this happening. So it, a lot of racial inequality going on just in this kind of effort. So here's an example. 158 women volunteered to go to Baltimore County, uh, but a lack of adequate housing meant only 60 women could be sent. And I don't know when they say they had tents. They did bring tents. But I think it had to do with, you know, tents is one thing, but there's just all kinds of things that go along with housing women or anybody, you know. Uh, here's Mrs. Ransom and her daughters, Susan and Janet. Now, here's a newspaper clipping. You can see that these women um, are socialites. Mm -hmm. and, and here they are. Uh, and so Mrs. Ransom actually headed the Rockville unit. Um, and um, this was seen as sort of a important, do-good, patriotic thing to do. Um, there you go. But women were required to wear uniforms that included hats, 
boots, work pants, shirts, or shirt dresses. And uh, excuse me a moment. <laughs> Okay, watch what goes on now. <laughs> <laughs> now, some of the mature women would not put those pants on <laughs> and had the skirts. Uh, and here are the young women, young, young women, a lot of college age women. Uh, but naturally, she was the supervisor. Uh, she was the farmer rat. Uh, they were all farmer rats, but you know, you'll see another picture. Um, the point here is uh, this was a nationwide movement. They were in, I think uh, it was 20, 23 states, about 15 to 20,000 women. That's not a lot really, but again, our population was smaller then. But in our own uh, state, there really aren't records on the numbers, but it looks to me like it might have been several hundred. Um, but uh, not in great number, but who they were were actually women of leisure, women who normally would be home, um, you know, entertaining socially, playing cards, that kind of person, or they were college students. In fact, most of them were college students. So there was a new activism growing among the young women and actually bringing the more mature women out of the dining room. And here is an example of how they're dressed. Again, very demurely. They have slacks on, but they've got shirt dresses over those slacks. Um, so they came from Goucher. A lot of them came from Goucher. And other women's colleges like Vassar and like uh, Bryn Mawr in Pennsylvania, uh, a lot of the women's colleges rose to this. And the women uh, came out. And here again, you can see the woman in the long skirt and yet the other women dressed as they are. So they were paid on a par with men. Um, but other states chose to pay hourly wages, generally $1.25 an hour. I tried to figure it out, you know, which is better, $12 a month or $1.25 an hour. And I actually think $1.25 an hour works a little better. Uh, but nevertheless, it was on a par with men, which I think is the point to keep in mind. So uh, this is about recruiting in the Baltimore American, a paper at the time, um, to do her bit. She's ready of work. She's not afraid. She's waiting for the summons. On um, fitting garb arranged, she'll grasp the tools of labor and never pine or fret, but do her stunt appointed the plucky farmerette. For soldiers sore are needed, and as to camp they go, to take the place now vacant of the man behind the hoe. The woman steps out bravely. She's never failed us yet. She'll now make a beginning with the sturdy farmerette. There's actually two more verses. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so in one story, uh, Catonsville farmer praised the intelligence of the women and the enthusiasm. They, plants, they planted, it was, um, I didn't put it down. I think it was five women who transplanted, yeah, it was five women, 6,000 tomato plants in eight hours. That's a lot of, a lot of work, yeah. <clears throat> These are actual photos here in Maryland, the, in Montgomery County. And so here we have, this is in Rockville, on a Rockville farm. You know, they're all dressed the same. A hay loader. I don't know actually how that's changed. Well, it's more mechanized. We don't have horses pulling hay loaders anymore. <clears throat> and here we have farmerettes returning from the fields, um, the same group. <laughs> and this is interesting. So this farmerette is at the Rosemont Farm in Rockville, and the property is now part of the Woodmont Country Club on Rockville Pike. The Rockville unit continued until December 1, 2019, after the war had ended, and after in Maryland, Pardon me? December 1st, 1919. Yeah, on the day. <gasps> oh, my goodness. You had it earlier. Early March, you had 2019 also. For 2017. I did a great job, didn't I? <laughs> sorry. Check your dates. Thank you for understanding. Oh, thanks. This will be corrected. I'm sorry. 
on the video, there it is. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it has to be. You're right, 1919. Goodness gracious. I, uh, I did put the final touches on this last night. Sorry. <laughs> what a shame. Well, anyway, um, but the point is, uh, though, uh, that the Rockville unit continued even after the uh, um, um, effort as and the state had ended because they were so dedicated. And the farmers, that was so interesting is the war had ended um, earlier in, in 1919, and um, the farmers, first of all, the soldiers coming back were not so anxious to go back to the farms. Yeah. And in fact, Lily Stone's son, Dunbar, decided he wanted to go west, young man. He wanted to go west and find a, you know, and do some mining and see if he could make real money. So he, he was done with farming, but he came back because it didn't, pardon the expression, pan out. <laughs> he came back. Um, but that was common. And also, some of the farmers really had found the women to do such a good job, they wanted them to stay. <laughs> and so some of the women did. Uh, and the Rockville unit was one very highly dedicated group of women, and they kept, they kept working. So farmerettes uh, brought the women out of domestic life into work life on the farms and brought college women into a new activism. Um, you know, there had been a suffragette movement, we know, um, but this is what energized women at another level and more of them. And so suffragettes continued to pick at the White House and women's groups, on the other hand, were extolling their contributions to the war. So suffragettes were now getting a new reputation that while they're fighting in the United, in America to get their rights, they're also showing, at least it's coming across, as strong patriotism because they're starting this movement. And so they're gaining a new um, vitality and a new legitimacy. People are accepting them more because they feel like, you know, they did a great job during World War I. And here's an example of uh, just a, a parade showing, showing what they've, uh, you know, some of the things they're carrying. Good job. Okay. From the, from the fields. So, um, as you know, Woodrow Wilson was the first president to advocate a constitutional amendment. And in, I got the date right this time, 1919, <laughs> Congress uh, passed the 19th Amendment. But it wasn't ratified, as you also know, until 1920. But here is the picture of when uh, the vote was passed, and it's showing uh, the list of um, it's showing states and which ones had voted for it, and so forth. So, in addition to the farmerettes, more than a million women found temporary employment for the first time in factories and offices. This was similar to what happened after World War II. But when the wartime opportunities, you know, evaporated, uh, so did jobs for women uh, in, both, in both cases. But nevertheless, uh, in both cases, again, it brought more women out of the house and into learning new skills and becoming more active in the world. So the Women's Land Army dissolved at the end of 1919. Boy, I'm so sorry about those other dates. Women marched again to the farms in a Women's Land Army during World War II. I actually didn't know that. We know so much about the battles of World War II. I didn't know there was a Women's <coughs> Land Army. And I've since learned uh, about family members in my life who actually were in that. Um, so it was not as uncommon, but we just don't hear about it. It's so interesting to me then. But again, America had changed, and so did women's roles and images. And so look at the difference in the posters. And again, you know, how women dressed and how they, you know, presented themselves. That's my story. Thank you. <laughs> um, so now we do have um, time, and so um, how much time do we have? Oh, good. So um, let's have a discussion, and let's have some questions about this and other things you know. Yes, in the back. So that, that was, you know, it was kind of an establishing that women did, whether or not 
that, I mean, was advertised like this, obviously back then, but that was, that was the thing that women did before World War I. I'm sorry, uh, I'm not, yes? Yeah. I'm oh, sorry, I didn't understand the question. What's the question, just comment. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay, yes. Yeah, as a matter of fact, um, in Nantucket, there is a strong tradition today of women business owners because their husbands uh, in the 19th century all sailed off to get whales. And so they were left to kind of handle everything. Right. And consequently, it's a very right. uh, feminist dominated business section downtown. Now that's great. Well, you know, um, again, this is a slice of what women did. This is a slice of what women did in Montgomery County. But uh, I was talking with um, Jenny Rose from now uh, about the fact, you know, you heard about uh, the Hello, Girl, Hello Girls? Mm -hmm. Right. So women went over <laughs> to handle the phones so that the armies could communicate, you know. Um, and they were not recognized until the 1970s, unlike the soldiers who came back uh, who were recognized. But women did other things than the farmerettes. But what this presentation is focused on is what was really the big deal in Montgomery County at the time was farming. And so when uh, men left the farms, I mean, there was a huge need and a huge importance placed on bringing you know, somebody out to do the work. And women stepped up. And the suffragettes saw it as a moment that the suffragettes really, it was a strategic decision. It wasn't just, oh, let's go help. It was, hey, we might be able to mobilize some more support this way and get done what we want to see done. So the suffragettes, it was uh, the book by um, Blanton, you know, clearly shows it was a strategic decision to bring women out to the farms. It was also a way, again, to get them outdoors. <laughs> yes. Yes. During World War One, she experienced considerable difficulty because she didn't speak English well. There are a lot of German communities in Montgomery County. Was there a similar problem with women who had been on the farm or had just come over, didn't need to speak English because they spoke German on the farm? Was there a problem here? Uh -huh. yeah. of, of people not being literate, yes, of course. Not only not being literate, but being discriminated against because suddenly they couldn't speak English. Oh, you know, I don't know the history of that, uh, ah. but it wouldn't surprise me. It wouldn't surprise me. Uh, but again, the, the government, what did surprise me, I actually didn't know this, that the government saw the need to communicate to people who couldn't communicate. Ah. And they went to great extremes, including, I mean, vaudeville shows became the way for government to talk about meatless, wheatless days and to communicate the, uh, the overall need of the war. And you know, there were other needs. In fact, um, I took this slide out, but I will just tell you one thing. Uh, you know, daylight savings time occurs in March. Um, and so in March uh, 1918, um, that's when it started. I think it was 18. Uh, it started, and, be, and everybody thought, oh, that was because we needed more hours on the farm or some ways, you know, it was going to help the farmer. The agricultural industry at the time protested against it because farming goes by the sun, up and down, not by the clock. And it turns out the reason government did, did that was to save electricity during wartime but didn't want people to know and be afraid, get fear, you know, have any fear about war, but it was to save electricity. And that was the reason. So government you know, is now involved in a war and what they're trying, you know, and they, they're, they're trying to feed, their, feed our people, feed our soldiers. It's the first time we've sent a huge army abroad uh, and the whole mechanism of all of that was causing a great need to communicate with people who couldn't communicate. And so that's why they went to great extremes, theater. And also uh, think about the world, you know, Irving Berlin and the World War I songs, you know, all the vim and vigor of that. Again, we're communicating messages. 
Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for that comment, but I don't know exactly, you know, but I'm sure people face some of that. Although every, nobody could speak English. <laughs> Think of it that way. There were so many Im immigrants and so many tongues. It wasn't just Germans. I mean, we had everything here. Yes? Uh, my family background, I can relate on the speaking German. Uh, it was from Austria and Alsace-Lorraine, and they spoke German. And my aunt was born in like 1906 or so. Uh, she spoke German at home. She went to school and she spoke nothing but German. And she got trouble. I heard there was some problems, <coughs> and I never quite knew what they were. And then my mother, who was younger, um, she was the one who uh, learned English at home, so that when she went to school, she was fine. At some point, I realized it was she spoke German. She was a little German girl. And it was World War One. Yes. And that's what it was. It was. German specifically. It was specifically German. German. Oh, I see what you're saying. My oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't thinking of it in the context of the war. Had been in the country no, for sure. For sure, there was discrimination against he, he got his Germans. citizenship right around that time. He made sure he got that paper, he and my grandmother. Um, no, and that's true. Even later on, when my, um, my mother was going out with, with my father, my father's Mother, I understand, was, oh, he brought home a German girl. Oh, boy. <laughs> now, that was like, you know, 1940s. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Yeah, no. Um, and no, absolutely, there was discrimination against Germans for being German because of the war. I'm sorry, I was thinking about it in terms of, I don't know, my mind just went to the language part of it. That was silly. But for sure, um, that's actually, there's, um, there's, there's been writing about that. And, um, um, to what extent, I mean, to what extent it went, I don't know that, but I do know it did occur. Yes? There was a Supreme Court case. Uh, Nebraska uh, prohibited the teaching of foreign languages, specifically German, and it w was overridden, uh, the dissent was written by, uh, the opinion was written by William O. Douglas, that you cannot constrain mm -hmm. education that way. Oh, that's great. And that was in the First World War? That was my second Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, because second, he wasn't second, Supreme Court Justice in the First World War. Yeah. Right. Yes. I found it interesting that a lot of these women were recruited from colleges, like Goucher. I was doing some research at the archives, and I saw some reports about the nurses. And there were a lot of women abroad during the war. I was amazed at how many American women served right there in the front, or just beyond, behind the front. And one of the uh, reports said that the nurses were from only the finest families <coughs> of Iowa. And it made me think, oh my gosh, there's a kind of snobbery about what girls can go be there with the soldiers, but also. Yeah, it's fun. interesting that most of these farmerettes really were from the better families. I don't know how to explain that. And college, I mean, just think about it. Um, somebody else gave me this fact maybe you're here right now, about how um, uh, more, more women went to college during world, uh, after World War I or during and after than they did even uh, after World War II. Um, yes? Was it the, the college women and the more, whatever, socially elevated women who joined up because the, the poorer women had to work? There was, yes, yes, these are women of leisure. And also, uh, another thing, the Women's Land Army was uh, not supported by government, had no funding. So they got the funding from the YWCA, the DAR, from women's groups, and from the flower garden clubs and the uh, canning group, <laughs> you know, the women's groups donated to it. Um, Okay, so th yes, the women of leisure were the ones who had the opportunity to do it and stepped up. Can you tell us about the word farmerette? Who started that? It, it was um, it was from suffragette, and as I said, I'm going to go back. It was Harriet Blanton, Harriet Stanton Blatch. Okay, she wrote this: women should be producing because. And in her book, 
she wrote a book. She used the term farmerette. They should become farmerettes. And she used it lightly, but it, it, it caught on. And so women who joined, and she would refer to them. She started the Women's Land Army, and she would refer to the recruits as, well, they're farmerettes. You know, and it just caught on, and that's what they were called. They weren't called Women's Land Army soldiers. They were called farmerettes. <laughs> Yes. I want to make sure I understand this. The, the farmer, the, the members of the land army aren't paid anything, right? No, they are. They're and paid they're, on a par with men. They're paid. Pay, they're paid. Yeah. Do they charge the the farmer, the landowner, um, for their labor? Does the land army, or is this a? They're paid the, by the farmer, just as the farmer would have paid the men. So are they competing with poor women who'd like to have those jobs? <laughs> I mean, it seems like if, if, if there's some labor shortage because of the war, but it implies that there's sort of nobody there to do the jobs. You need to hire college women. Well, you and need, to hire, you need to hire women, and it's the college women that stepped up. Now, yeah. you could say the other women, um, again, if they were not African-American, um, they might be also still working on the farms, you know, they might be, or they would be doing, you know, general store kinds of things, or, or they were home with the children, uh, or home, just home. Um, so it just depended who signed up. But most of the people who signed up, because the women's colleges promoted this, and the suffragettes, she went to Vassar, you know, were promoting it through one place where you knew you could get large numbers of women, Co women's colleges, women's colleges. Um, and young women also were sturdy, able to get out and do hard labor. Uh, they didn't know they could do that because they'd never been brought up that way, but now they were trained, there was training. So, so I, I can't answer the question beyond that. I mean, so the land army sort of provided the connection that <coughs> allowed these uh, college women to, to find jobs to work for the farmer. Because it seemed like it would be possible that the farmer would say, I need labor, and whatever the market is, who, whoever is willing to work for them, just hire them. That's right. Anybody could join. There was no discrimination about who could join. It was just, it's just in terms of if you're trying to recruit thousands of women or hundreds, wherever your location is, you're going to where you can recruit large numbers of women. Yes? Very interesting. You make the point about women being paid the same rate as men in, in farming. In industry, World War I, I'm wondering about that, however, if that was the same. Because I know in World War II, it was not. That's correct. It was not the same. That's why, okay. that's why it's noted here, okay. uh, that the, um, the Women's Land Army made that stip stipulation, that they had to be paid the same rate. Suffragettes. <laughs> yeah. Well, excuse me, let me get, uh, yeah. um, yes, go ahead. One thing about World War I and women going into war work was <coughs> they didn't have the opportunity to work at all if they were not just t you know, doing um, tenement work, you know, peace work. They, they were allowed to go out and work and the pay was so much better than anything they would get doing peace work at home. So it was an improvement. And like in, in England, women were in service, and doing war work was better than this being in service because you got better pay and you had better independence. You weren't chaperoned. And that was a big issue. Was that was a big issue here. about not being chaperoned. Yes. Excuse me. My question is. What incentive did the male farmers have to pay the women the same amount they pay men? I'm sorry. What, what incentive? You make the remark that women, these women were paid the same as men. What incentive did did the, the farmers have to do that? Why? If, if they wanted help, that was the rule. <laughs> that you could have women's land army on your property or not. You could pay them this or not. You needed help. Yeah, right. And, and that was a going rate. That was a going rate. There was a shortage of workers. Remember all the young men 
had left. I mean, particularly in Montgomery County, I showed you the, the quota for, rec for you know, registering was 131, and over 2,000 men signed up. And That's a lot of, of men. work in the industries, and they weren't paying them the same. What, what's there? What's there is, again, if you want your uh, field tilled, if you want it, the, food, the product, products harvested, you have to pay the going rate. The uh, women would come help if you pay them on a par with what you were paying men, $12 a month. That, that's the incentive. You get help if you will pay for it. Yes. Could it be that um, in the industrial factories there were more of the lower class women or the poor women who were less educated and of they course. weren't able to demand of course. higher wages and there were a lot of them, right. but to go out on the farms, right. of course. They, they, you know, they weren't located in the urban areas so they needed to right. pay more. I'm sure that was a factor, I'm sure. Um, again, I want to stress that um, industrialization was not the biggest deal here in, Mar in Maryland at the time. It was farming. It was farming. Yes. Um, I think we forget that at that time, almost everyone had a family garden and they kept food for the winter. Right. They had canned. Uh, there was no freezing. They they had to put up food for the families for the winter. Food was not circulated that widely and easily, but everybody did it. I understand. Um, but we had a country at war and a need to not only, and again, you might have your own garden, but you still might have needed, you know, some of the produce from, you know, you don't necessarily have wheat growing in your garden. Uh, you might need to get the farmer's wheat or whatever. You still had a need to get other farm products. Uh, but also, there was a need our country had. Maryland was sending food abroad. We needed to feed our soldiers. So it was more than just feeding you know, a little bit of the war garden for your own family. It was much more. But also, if you did a war garden, you also knew how to can. And exactly. We need That's my point. OK. And you needed to right, join. But then what we had to do, there was a big effort to get people out of their own yards to a community, a communal canning area. That was They were not used to doing that. They were used to, just as you said, do their own thing for their family. But now we needed to get them out of the house to another, another location where everybody sat around doing the canning. And they did an incredible job, as you saw from those statistics. Yeah, but you're absolutely right. They already had some expertise in doing that. Oh, and that means putting things up in jars, because there was not much canned tin food. That was not right. 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 Yeah. Yes? Um, I'm sorry. Let's take her, then you. Were there, <coughs> were there offices where the, these women would go and sign up and know where their assignment would be? Yeah. Were there locations on the posters, like, you know, for a job, go here? You know, that, uh, that's one of the questions I could not find an answer to. They had to have a way. They had to have a way to communicate with each other. And, and certainly, like Mrs. Ransom, who headed the unit, uh, they, uh, she obviously wrote letters and things. But uh, in terms of a location where people gathered, that wasn't clear. Uh, because again, she had, coming to Rockville, people from Goucher. She had people coming to Rockville even from Washington, DC, and from Pennsylvania. So where did they go? I mean, how did, I don't know. There was no, no record of it that I could find. Um, but it seemed like there would have been some place. But I think there was a lot of letter writing and postcards. There were phones. Pardon me? There were phones. There were not phones. Yeah, right. There was, yeah, exactly, how to communicate. Yeah. Yes. How much backlash was there, or was there any, about um, upper class women doing unfeminine jobs or wearing unfeminine clothing. Really good point. Absolutely, there was backlash. There was, uh, which was another reason why farmers didn't, uh, some farmers didn't want the women. They felt there was no way that these socialites could do this work. There was just no way. Which is why when you got a Catonsville farmer to, you know, praise the work of the women, that helped get a few other farmers on board, but in general, there's a lot of that feeling, this, ah, this is silly, this is not going to work. Um, and so again, you had the shortage, and so 
you had children out in the fields and you had uh, retired people out in the fields and um, yeah, yeah. Yes. Were the farmer rights ever recognized after the war, or any uh, yes. domestic? Yes, but it, well, in, in our rights? state, yes. Uh, they were highly praised, and Mrs. Ransom herself <laughs> uh, got a big you know, certificate from the governor. Um, I've seen a picture of that kind of idea, and uh, they were highly praised. And in fact, in terms of the whole uh, United States effort, Maryland, uh, I think it was like three states were viewed as being the most productive in producing the most food um, during a period when you wouldn't have expected that, and Maryland was one. And again, and, and it was attributed um, in, in various uh, writings that I've seen from government agencies to those farmerettes, that they were highly praised. It was just... You know, when you think about it, I mean, these are women who were not schooled on the farm, unlike f farm families that, you know, knew everything to do. These, these were privileged women, most of them. Most of them were privileged women who really had not done back-breaking kinds of work and gladly stepped up to it and uh, were trained, and they did it. So it's like, woohoo! <laughs> it was really great. Yes. I was on a tour of World War I sites in the fall and went to villages where we were eating, put in parts of France. And the local exhibits there about World War I always acknowledge the donations of food from the United States. No, Every little huge. village had some kind of. I mean, <coughs> it was a major slogan food will win the war. I mean, it was true, you know? Um, such an interesting period. Yes. I know that uh, I don't think that it was during World War One, but definitely during World War II, the British government mandated that if you had X land, you had to cultivate so much of it with certain crops. Did ever any of that ever happen here? Like no. you said, you know, you had to have a certain percentage of grain crops or root crops or there was a little of that. Um, I did see see that. I didn't get into the full um, food cons food effort, but I did see um, and like on, uh, people had to report what they were producing, you know, and how much of it. And then uh, there was, I did see some correspondence about, you know, we really need you to do a little more of this. Um, and, and people gladly went along with, with whatever was needed. Uh, even on um, Lily, Lily Stone's farm, um, I had a letter, I saw a letter that she had written reporting just how many, um, bushels of this and that that she had produced, and then having a, a letter back that was saying, um, you did a great job. Um, we wonder if you could improve on one, this other product. And I don't know her response, but I'm assuming that she went along. Yes. Well, considering that this is Maryland, were tobacco farmers affected? I mean, they gave away mountains of cigarettes during the war. Um, were there farmettes on the tobacco farm? Um, not that I'm aware of, no. Um, no, it was food. It was food. It was food. Yeah. Um, so, anyway, I wanted to just mention, if you're interested uh, at all, um, this, this is what started me on, on um, all of this. And I have in this book um, quite uh, Dunbar, the World War I uh, uh, soldier. He, um, he sent zillions of postcards home, which have all been saved. And so uh, it's just interesting to hear what he's, he talked about his training and how cold it was. He received $30.50 a month and when he was in training, and he sent it, half of it home to his mother. Um, and sometimes he needed cash and he asked for her to send it back and then there was this huge issue of how he would get it and checks, you know, writing checks was very unusual and so that was, that was a problem. Um, and then he talked about how um, that the government didn't furnish towels or soap and we have to do our own washing. <laughs> and, he, and he talked about, um, you know, blankets and things but he didn't need those socks. 
Uh, but, uh, you know, for what it's worth, there is more about, you know, the soldier's point of view uh, in the letters he wrote and, well, the postcards, too. It was just amazing. Um, this family, the Stone family, kept <coughs> everything. I mean, there are such records of the farm, and then later, as you know, you know, she founded the Historical Society, but in be before that, she founded a quarry. So here was a woman who, um, she was a lieutenant in the Food Conservation Army, but then in 1924, uh, when the, far uh, the war's over, her son is off in the West. Her farm is just not doing well. She doesn't know what to do. Um, and somebody finds stone on her property and tells her that he would um, be happy to buy it if she wants to help him get to it. And she decided, okay, whatever, I'll start a quarry. And she did, and she hired 30 men in a truck. What kind of a, I mean, this is a woman who's only been a farm woman, a, uh, the wife of a farmer, but becomes, you know, the farmer. And what does she turn into? A prominent businesswoman in our area. So I think that that's kind of her story. She was not a suffragette that we know. We've seen no record of her actually officially being a suffragette. But here is a woman, an example of a woman um, who tells that story quite well. Anyway, the reason I mention that only is because this is what got me going <laughs> on finding out more about the Food Conservation Army <laughs> and the uh, Women's Land Army. Thank you very much for coming.